Madonna. Well, great. Hello, everyone. I'm Christopher Baxter. And I'm Malte Ugo. We're here to talk about concurrency in JavaScript with a particular focus on the DOM. Now, concurrency is a big topic. It's maybe a complicated topic. So let's look at some of the basics behind it. Concurrency is really, it's just a te technical word for multiple parts of a computer program running at the same time. Now, if your computer or phone has more than one core, which it does, or you have more than one computer, which the cloud does, then this can make things get mu done much faster. However, it generally also makes things way more complicated. Speaking of concurrency, we always kind of have to talk about like the difference between parallelism and concurrency. They're just the same thing, but someone in the 80s took away the awesome word, which is parallelism, and made it mean something very specific. But that doesn't matter. We're going to say parallelism and concurrency in the shades of all. Who cares? So another important uh, concept are threats. They're just programs that run on a computer. And there can be more than one threat active at any given time. Now, concurrency doesn't require multiple threats. For example, network requests can happen while your main thread is running, and so that's still a concurrent program. But if you have only one thread, then your program can only do one thing on a, at a time on a given device. So we so call such a program single-threaded, and that's an important term because web browsers, which we're talking about today, are traditionally single-threaded. Now, today, they're like these complicated beasts, and they do many things at the same time, but they very much still behave as if they were single-threaded. So it's a good model to have in your head. The single thread we call the main thread, and very important in this JSConf, your JavaScript runs on the main thread by default. So if you write some JavaScript and it's still running, then your browser cannot do anything at the same time, which might be bad because, oh my god, we have to achieve 60 frames per second all the time. Um, where does this number come from? That's basically the fundamental constant of runtime performance. It's how often, on a normal device, your graphics card would like to push pixels to the screen. Now, humans don't you know, bias to this particular framework, frame rate. For example, movies traditionally run at 24 frames per second. Important is that they always run at 24 frames per second. Humans are really good at recognizing changes in frame rate. If frame rate is unstable, we call that jank, and jank is really bad because it makes our you know, brains go wild. Now, 60 frames per second leads to another magic number, which is 60 milliseconds. That's just 1,000 milliseconds in a second divided by 60, which is what you have to update the screen, right? Well, unfortunately, it's more complicated. So there is you, and then there is stuff the browser does, which is layout, style calculation, painting, compositing, actually physically fi flipping the pixels on the screen. And everything in that 60 milliseconds has to fit into that kind of budget. Great, so let's break that down a little bit because it's pretty darn complicated. You've got 16 milliseconds, a lot of code to execute, and you're trying to get it all done within this time frame. The important thing to remember, though, is that it's not just your code. Your code runs for a certain amount of time, and the browser needs to respond to the changes that you asked it to do as well in that time frame. And sometimes we think about this as breaking it into two eight millisecond segments. The reason is that the time that the browser needs is kind of arbitrary. We don't know that in advance, and so we shoot for pretty much the worst case. So what happens in this eight milliseconds? We have a lot of stuff to do, and let's hope it's not too expensive. We get a click event that lands in our UI, and after we get that click event, we need to process the event. Now, many traditional modern frameworks will then do a state change at this point, so we need to determine what that new state is going to be. That takes some time. After we've created a new state, we need to respond to that state. So this response may be a virtual DOM diff in some libraries, or it may be a direct mutation of elements in others. Later, we have to issue the direct DOM updates. It's a lot of work to fit in eight milliseconds, and we don't always make it. So what happens when we don't? Well, we push everything out. So now instead of being eight milliseconds, we're at 10 milliseconds in this example because my state change process took 
two milliseconds longer. What does this mean for the end user? It's not that big of a deal, right? Well, it means that we went past our frame budget. Because we took 10 milliseconds, the browser really needs eight. We're now at 18. Congratulations, we've unintentionally introduced a little bit of jank. Now, don't feel bad. We all do this. It's common. It happens to all of our applications. Just don't let it happen too much, right? However, it's hard to keep this going and hard to make this work well across all devices because you can target the devices that you know, but you don't know the performance of your application on unknown devices. Why? Well, because not all mobile devices are created equal. We've got a plethora of devices that are out in the world. Things from low-end devices that are sold for $80 brand new to high-end devices at $1,000 per unit. And sometimes people hold on to devices for way longer than you would expect. A person buying a phone in 2016 is probably still holding on to that phone. And the performance of that device has not improved. In fact, it's gotten worse. So it's important to remember that the things that you see are not everything, is not everything that a person using your application sees. So let's go into this a little bit more in depth. Pretend we're walking into a brand new big store like a Best Buy and we're gonna buy a new device today. It's helpful to think about a device that you're purchasing as breaking down into one of three segments. The first segment, the, first, the 15th percentile, is roughly around $80. So if you were walking in today and you wanted to spend around $80, you could afford a device in this specific segment of the market. The second segment is around 75th percentile where you're looking at spending close to $600. That's a really large increase. And the third segment is the special segment, I would say, because you're able to spend $1,000 on this device. One device, $1,000. Now this gamut of price is not normally reflected in our metrics. We tend to look at things as a whole. However, if you break things down into these segments, patterns start to emerge. So let's look at single core performance over time. This is a chart of all single core performance of modern devices from 2011 to 2018. Now the segments are again highlighted here. So blue is the 15th percentile. You might notice that this trend line is not going up. And there's a reason for that. These devices are not becoming faster, they're becoming cheaper and more accessible and more prolific across the world. These devices are not improving at the rate that you would expect with Moore's Law. The second category is that 75th percentile. And this is a pretty close approximation to what you would expect from Moore's Law. We're seeing an improvement in performance over time. And these devices can even have specialized hardware like a Pixel does that allows you to do, say, machine learning on the device. Our th third category is worth talking about as well. Credit where credit is due. The A series processors are fantastic. These things outperform Moore's Law by a dramatic amount, but it creates a very large problem for our industry as a whole. The problem is that we take out the devices that we have in our pockets and we test the things that we build on these devices. These devices are not representation, are not a, an accurate representation of what's available in the world or what many people have. So this particular gap hurts end users significantly. And it's important to remember this very large performance gap. This gap is increasing, not decreasing. There has to be some good news, right? We wouldn't be talking about concurrency if there wasn't some very small light at the tunnel maybe. Uh, at the end of the tunnel. So what's multi-core performance look like? Let's look at those same devices in this first category, the 15th percentile. You can see that the green trend line is slightly improving compared to single core performance. There is one noticeable exception at the very end of this line, the Nokia 2. It's worth calling out because it's a very popular phone that you can buy for $80 in the United States and it is selling like crazy. But it can't be that bad, right? Uh, I want you to bear with me. We're about to watch a very long video, but it's worth the time. Here, I have two devices, an iPhone on the left and an unnamed device on the right. You just name it. It's a Nokia 2. <laughs> this test, the Aries 6 test, tests modern JavaScript features. Uh, for instance, one of the things that it runs is a Babel transpilation on the device. You might uh, criticize that test by saying no one would run Babel on a mobile phone, and you're right for criticizing it. 
However, it is a good representation of what runtime performance is like. There's no load involved. There's no network involved. It's pure capabilities of the local device. And it's entirely single core focused. So we've got the iPhone here on the left. It's gonna finish this test pretty soon. All six passes of the test are gonna finish at roughly 48 seconds. Now, I'm gonna speed it up a little bit because it's a bit painful. The Nokia 2 is gonna be running this test for a while longer, and we're just gonna wait a couple minutes. Okay, now I've sped it up eight times. We still haven't finished one pass of six. There are six no passes. It hasn't crashed, I promise. <laughs> hey, all right, five minutes and 19 seconds for one of six passes. That's pretty bad, but that's what a lot of people's devices are like, and that's what a lot of people are entering the internet using for the first time. All right, so what I kind of took out of these graphs is performance is not evenly distributed, but there is a chance to get a little bit more out of the devices by taking advantage of their multiple cores. So how do we do that in JavaScript? Well, super excited to announce super amazing new API called the Web Worker, which has actually been around since 2009. <laughs> do folks remember Ajaxian? <laughs> if Ajaxian wrote about something, you have to check whether it's still supported, not whether the browser supports it. This, is, this API is in every browser. It's in IE8, it's not in IE6, all right, so it's not in every browser, but it is in every browser you care about. We can really take advantage of it. So what are they? They are a way to write multi-threaded JavaScript in web browsers. Now, you've probably heard that multi-threading can be like dangerous and, and memory unsafe, so this is not the case here. Workers share no state at all with each other, or the main thread. Right? Um, they have only access to a very limited set of APIs, so they can't do everything you can do on the main thread. And, and this is very important for this presentation, they do not have access to the DOM. And we're talking about concurrency in the DOM, so sad face. Um, let's take a look at how that API looks like. The worker, you know, you just make a worker, you give it a JavaScript file, and then it runs and you can send it messages with post message. Um, this kind of usually looks like this, you know, you get some event, you send a message to the worker, the worker receives the message, does some computation, sends it back, we receive it back, we have to compute it. Um, I think one of the main things here is we have to very, very consciously write code like this. We have to measure that we have to, we have to you know, do the work. 10 years of adoption have shown that this is not something we do very often, right? So there's a problem with this programming model. So the primitive is too low level. Is there something a bit more abstracted, perhaps usable in comparison? I'd like to go over a few things that are showing some progress in this space. First one's called Clooney. It's made by the Chrome team. Uh, the way that it works is the JavaScript that you wanna run in a separate thread is actually loaded with your main thread JavaScript. So in this case, we have a class that exists within the main thread, but using Clooney, we're able to spawn an instance of that, uh, that class that runs entirely in the worker. So what happens is Clooney underneath the hood creates a web worker for you, sends over the JavaScript that it needs to be able to execute in the worker, and you can just await its response. But it would be great if this was actually in the browser itself, right? This is something that feels like it should be an ECM ECMAScript level spec. So there's a few specification outs that are, that are trying to bring this to ECMAScript. Uh, the one that I think is the most interesting is called JS Blocks, but it has an umlaut above the O, so I don't know I how to pronounce it. JS Blocks. Blocks. Whatever he said. <laughs> so the way that this one works is very similar to the last example in the sense that the block that we're defining here that has this additional straight lines um, is, it indicates that this piece, specific piece of code can run in any thread. It may run in the main thread, it may run in a different thread. It's up to the browser runtime, or the JavaScript runtime in this case, to determine based on system resources where this should run. But this presents a pretty big problem in JavaScript because this thing wouldn't have access to lexical scope. It only knows about the scope of its current block. 
It can't know about anything outside of it because it may not run in the same thread. Well, the proposal provides some syntax to allow you to specify the things that you would like to ensure are available in that, within that specific block. In this case, something that looks a little bit like TypeScript uh, is included, so you can say, for this specific worker instance, I'd like to make sure the endpoint dogs are best is passed along. Let's look at something a little bit more easy to use, straightforward, applies to many of our applications today. Um, many of us use Redux in this room, and many of us across the globe use it from a really great earlier talk today. Um, so Redux is pretty powerful, but it runs in the main thread. So what happens in that earlier model is we would need to run our entire Redux store and reducers for all of those actions in the main thread. Stockroom from Jason Miller is very similar to Redux, except that it runs in a worker. So your main thread code subscribes to updates that come from your Redux store, but your networking requests and your Redux um, um, kind of massaging of data happens entirely off the main thread. This can free up a significant amount of your time in a web app that uses Redux heavily. But I thought this talk was about the DOM. You are absolutely right. Uh, so, Malta. Yeah, so as I said earlier, the workers cannot have access to the DOM. Um, which is sad, and so I'm super excited to announce that we're releasing a library called Worker DOM, which exposes the same DOM API that you know and love to you and the frameworks in a web worker. Let's take a look at the original requirements when we went about uh, kind of building this library. I was like, hey Chris, can you make it so that React works in a web worker? And that was really all I wanted, but, <laughs> but then Chris was, yeah, you know, um, Where's the fun in that? Let's do something more abstract. Let's do something that supports uh, the whole variety of web programming. So what is Worker DOM? It makes the full DOM API available through Web Worker. Effectively, this means that you can use your existing web app and run in a Web Worker, and it just works. With some terms and conditions, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, we'll go in there. Uh, let's look at the use cases. You can use this to speed up your existing app. app. Yay. Um, framework authors can use it to speed up their existing framework with making minor changes. And one particular use case that I'm very excited about, you've probably heard that third-party JavaScript, other people's JavaScript, like your analytics framework, ads, you know, they're a problem for your site because you don't control them and they might do bad things. Wouldn't it be nice if you just run them in a worker and they kind of did their own thing but they couldn't touch your code? Um, I think this is an amazing use case where this library could be super powerful. All right, let's take a look what it does to your program. Um, coming back to this example that Chris introduced earlier. Um, so, you know, we have this main thread and we're doing like event processing, state determination processing, dumb issues, the browser does some work. And those things, they added up to 18 milliseconds. There's a second number there, which is the latency, uh, which is 18 milliseconds. So it took 18 milliseconds to react to a user action. That's yellow because that is actually okay. If you're familiar with the Rails model, for example, it actually gives us 50 milliseconds to react to the user. So that's kind of cool, right? So, um, but we're janky. So let's introduce worker DOM. The first three steps of your application without changing them go into a background thread. Now the whole thing still takes 18 milliseconds, no change there, but the stuff that actually is on the main thread is now massively reduced. We're now 10 milliseconds, which is silky smooth. And I think the important part here is that we're now far away from breaking through the barrier of 60 milliseconds, right? So now we can run on a slower device and we still have a lot of budget to go to make it there, right? If we're, if we're just about like scraping against that 16 MS on an iPhone X, um, it's not gonna go well in the, in the wild. So I think this is really like a very promising way of building an application. I'm excited to see how that's going to um, go out. Um, let's look at those terms and conditions really quick. Um, now, the library isn't like 100% done, so some DOM APIs just aren't implemented yet. Um, that's cool because you know we can just do it. Um, there are a small number of DOM APIs that cannot be implemented, but there are, uh, there are alternatives provided, and then there's a smaller number of DOM APIs which cannot be implemented and worker DOM can't really work with them at all. So let's take a quick look at those last two categories. First of all, they're unimplementable, but there is an alternative. These are primarily DOM APIs 
that provides synchronous access to stuff like completed layout of a page. So for example, um, if you are, many of you will be familiar with this get founding client rect. So like, hey browser, how big is this div, right? When you call that function in the main thread, what the browser will do is will go run its entire layout pipeline if that's necessary and just go like full in the browser, go all the way back and that's all synchronous. Um, that's not implementable in a worker because there's no sync access to the DOM. So what we do instead, we provide alternatives. They all have an async suffix. So like get founding client direct async and it returns a promise. Now you don't have to change your program much. You just add the async suffix, add an await before. If you're using async await, which you should, and your program works again, right? So it's a, it's a minor change. And there's an important side benefit. Um, if you go and optimize your application, one of the things you're looking out for is that you don't make the sync layout calls more than once in a given frame. If you, if you make that call, you change something, make a call again, you pay it twice. If you order syncs the right way, you only pay it once. So by you, uh, switching to this async model, the framework can actually schedule stuff at the right time without you having to worry about it, which is a much more scalable problem. So I think this is the right direction for the DOM to go anyway. Um, these old synchronous APIs from the 1990s, just not the right way to do it. All right, um, unimplementable without an alternative. These are primarily synchronous methods on event, like prevent default and stop propagation. Now, the browser's event processing model is inherently synchronous. And that means by the time the worker learns about the click event, the entire browser event chain already ran. And that means that you, you, know, you might call stop propagation, but that doesn't do anything because you know, event processing already ran, so you know, nothing you can do. Um, there's actually light at the end of the tunnel. Transferable events are a thing that might come to browser soon, and that would kind of fix this situation. But for now, basically what it means is if you need these APIs, and think at, you know, about your last application, how often you actually call them, it's not that much. You have to run that little bit of your code on the main thread um, to make sure it still works. Speaking of working, uh, how does this library actually work? So we don't need to understand all of the guts of this thing, but I thought it'd be helpful to go over the kind of the high level as well as some of the details that I thought were particularly interesting during the implementation. So let's start with the high level. We start off with a main thread and a worker thread. On the main thread, we have a runtime, roughly one kilobyte of JavaScript. And this runtime is able to look at what the DOM is on the current page. In this case, we have an element, an HTML element that we would like to upgrade to run in within the worker context. And inside of that, just a single div just to make things simple. So the first thing that happens is the runtime will create a worker for you and load your JavaScript within that worker. Now worker DOM exists within the worker thread and is able to start processing your code. At this point, your code will create the DOM structure that it would like to have in the document. So we have a document with our HTML div element and then there's a lull, your code is finished performing an update to the DOM. In this case, we consider it hydration. So we, might, we make sure that that message is passed along over and applied to the main thread. Later, as you have input events or things that need to mutate the DOM, like click handlers, we will allow mutations to occur. This is very simple high level and kind of explains what worker DOM does and how it operates. But let's dive in a little bit more on hydration. So what is hydration? Hydration is the conversion of string markup into usable DOM nodes. A helpful way to understand this is to look at how the browser actually does this with its tokenizer. Pretend that we have a section element, and in this case, because we're using worker DOM, it has an attribute source that points to the JavaScript file of your JavaScript. That is actually represented in the DOM as an HTML section element. Inside that, we have a HTML div element because I'm pretty bad at semantic markup. And inside of here, we'll have three child nodes, a text node that says hello world, followed by a span, HTML span element with some text inside of it that says spanner, and lastly, an, an HTML input element. So this is how the browser would tokenize these specific elements into DOM structures. Worker DOM does roughly the same thing. However, we need to be able to transmit these objects between threads. So we need a single interface that makes it easy to transmit this information that we, so we don't have to have all of these different class types to understand between threads. So in this case, our div can be represented as a hydratable node. It's got an element type of node, uh, the node type is an element node. The tag name is div, 
we need a unique identifier so we can reference that node on both sides of the bridge. And whether or not it's been transferred is actually incredibly important because once it's been transferred, the format doesn't need to be as verbose. We only need to send a very small amount of information once we've transferred it once. So we were able to convert that div element over to a hydratable node, and you can see how we can take the same pattern and apply it to the rest of this DOM structure. So now we're looking at a tree of entirely hydratable nodes. This structure is transferable between threads and allows us to send the information in an efficient way. So let's look at an actual example. Here's a JSON representation of that interface. I've got the node type here, the node name, child nodes, that there's only a single child in this case, um, and that unique identifier index and transferred false. So something we've learned about web workers in this is that given the same complexity of your messages, a smaller size transmits faster and is more responsive to end user input. So we need to do some work to this, this format to ensure that it remains small independent of the number of nodes that you give it. So we apply a substitution cipher, which is just a fancy term for a replacement, to node name, node, uh, the node type, child nodes, index, and transferred. These are all static keys that we, we store and allow us to, to convert over our object structure into keys based on the index uh, of those strings. Next, we have some false and trues as values. Well, those can be represented as zeros and ones, so let's go ahead and do that. And lastly, we have now something we can't do at build time. So all those other transformations could be done at build time because we know both sides of the equation uh, at, at all times. But your markup has different text in it. Your markup has different DOM nodes in it. We can't bake in all of the possible string permutations that your code would use. So we create a string pool that will contain all of the strings that are needed for your application as you use them. And we only transmit the parts of the pool that have not yet been received on both sides of the thread, uh, both sides of the threads. So now we're able to represent this format in a fairly succinct way. And you can see that we're getting closer and closer and closer to a pure integer representation of this structure. In the future, we'll be able to move this entirely to a typed array. And that's where we will end up. But for now, we've got a fairly efficient format that has very little overhead. So now that we've got this format for individual hydratable nodes, we need to be able to look at what the interface for hydration itself looks like. Um, a little bit more complex in that we have to pass that string pool over. Next, mutation. Static document would be extremely boring if that was all we could do. We need to be able to respond to those input events. Here we have a span that we created and a click event listener that's attached to it. When that happens, we are able to then use the class list, DOM token list method to toggle a class name, as well as change the style of a different div that is not defined in this example. How does this work? Well, we use a mutation observer. And because we built the DOM implementation, we could build our own mutation observer, which has superpowers. So instead of just being able to modify things like attribute changes or changes to the tree structure, we can also uh, observe things like value changes. So we know property changes, not just attributes. That was a lot of information, so we had to steal Laurie's joke. Uh, <laughs> we're not actually going to do it because Laurie did it. Uh, I just wanted to emphasize. Uh, I just wanted to emphasize that um, we talked about how it works because it's interesting. But um, one of the magical things about worker DOM is I was like looking at the README and like, where's the usage statement? And it doesn't have one, right? Like the the you just make a worker and then you say like document get element by ID or you make your React component, right? Like it's, it doesn't have an API because it's just the DOM API in the web worker. So I think that's actually kind of cool. Um, speaking of which, um, do we want to like show a demo? Yeah, let's do a demo. So we're kind of short on time. Um, and so right. what I'm gonna do is something akin to this meme. I love this one. We're gonna start with the left and we're gonna move to the owl quickly. <laughs> All right, I've got some demos here. So the first one uh, that we'll go into is a vanilla DOM implementation. So this is actually the example we talked about during the slides. So we've got hello world as a text node, a span with some text inside of it and an input element. 
As I click here, you can see changes occurring. This is the least glamorous demo ever. However, believe me, all of this is happening in a worker. Now if I come here, I can type remove and we'll remove a node. Next demo. That wasn't very impressive. <laughs> this can't possibly be fast, right? We're having to serialize a bunch, a bunch of information transfer between threads. I thought we'd show something that kind of pushes the boundaries of what right performance of the web would be like. So we built a dbmon implementation. So if runs. you're familiar with like virtual DOM frameworks, they all implement dbmon to like show how awesome and fast they are. Um, I don't know if this is fast or not compared to uh, some other frameworks, but it certainly seems to work well on low-end devices. And just to show that this is not cheating, we'll do a little record. And let's sneak in at the actual snapshot of work. You can see we're fairly close to 60 frames per second across the board, and the code is split directly across the main thread here and the worker thread. The worker thread is running the entirety of our JavaScript framework in this case, and that's highlighted by these um, kind of light pink categorizations. And the browser is doing its work in the main thread, and you can see that by these large purple and uh, green uh, streaks. Fantastic. So we wanted to ensure that this framework and that this technology would work with many different frameworks, not just one or the other. So we implemented the exact same application in both Preact and React. This is a fake mapping diagram from some data that I found on the internet. It's a very abstract map. <laughs> <laughs> And this is an SVG, so as we modify this, we're able to make mutations to the, to the SVG graphic um, across the bridge. And that example is running Preact. Let's do the same example, but in React, and everything seems to still work. By the way, this is running the latest version of React. Um, I'm, I'm certain there's some new things there that are supposed to be pretty cool. Um, lastly, I thought I'd do an example of to-do MVC, since that seems to be the canonical thing people show when they are demonstrating a new technology. Um, this to-do MVC implementation works pretty well, if I can actually type. Again, and this is like not to-do to MVC written for worker DOM, it's just to-do MVC running inside of worker DOM. And I can go ahead and remove an item, and you can very barely see that there is the item count is updating and DOM nodes are being removed. Okay, great. All right, so can, can you try this? Yes, worker DOM, hopefully, just became available on GitHub and NPM a few minutes ago. It is still very alpha, uh, you know, as software goes. Uh, I think our main goal is not to like all of you go run and use this in your production application, please don't, eventually do. But especially, and I know lots of you are here, if you maintain a framework, a build tool, we really wanna make sure that they work together with Worker DOM, that there's no missing features and that you know, some of the problems might be, uh, might be solved. Um, I also wanna talk really quick as to like why we're, like, Chris and I are building this. Um, so we are working on a um, project at Google called AMP, and our goal with WorkerDOM is to allow authors of AMP documents to run their own JavaScript in AMP documents, which you currently can't, and that's terrible, because I like JavaScript. Um, and so we all use WorkerDOM to do this. And I think this is important for an open source project, so because it's alpha today, but we will make it rock solid for this use case, and so it's, usable for, for everyone else's in their non amp web pages as well. Um, yeah, and that's really all we had. Thank you very much. Uh, here's the link to GitHub, the slides, the blog post, with Christopher and, and me. Thank you.